Well, happy post Thanksgiving, everyone. You made it. Hopefully, all your travels went well. Time with family was a blessing. But it's always good to be together with our church family after you've been with our regular family as well. And I'm glad you guys are here. Hopefully, you're staying warm. We were the smart ones that decided to camp out in this cold weather for Thanksgiving. Yes, it was, uh, it was a little bit chilly, but we had a great view of the lake and we survived. So it was great. A lot of great family bonding time trying to stay warm. <laughs> but uh, I'll, I'll be honest, when it comes to Thanksgiving, I'm a little weird. I am. I, I like Thanksgiving food, okay? I like Thanksgiving food. In fact, my mother-in-law made an awesome spread for Thanksgiving, it was all d- very delicious. My mom makes delicious Thanksgiving food and I enjoy it, but I never actually look forward to it. Like, I don't ever think, oh yes, Thanksgiving food, this is the time, I'm ready for this, this is my game, I'm ready for some Thanksgiving food, let's do this. You know, the green bean casserole, check, the turkey, check, gravy, check, mashed tates, let's do this. I, I don't ever get jazzed about it. I don't know if it's just like, I think, oh, this is just, it's all mush. It's like. Grown up baby food? I don't know. <laughs> but it all tastes good. Maybe that's by design. I don't know. I'm weird like that. I think about it. Like, why is cranberry sauce not a sauce? It's, it's on some gelatinous substance to keep you like, you know, the, that palate cleanser between the various different mushes. I, I don't know. I'm weird like that when it comes to Thanksgiving food. And, uh, but you know what? Our family is probably weirder than, what, than you think it is, right? You all get together, maybe... You know, you're the weird uncle. Maybe you don't know you're the weird uncle. I don't know. And sometimes conversations can get strange and awkward at Thanksgiving. Everyone's invited. Who knows what's going to happen? You know, maybe you're the one always stuck at the kid's table no matter how old you get. You know, I was like, I'm like 50 years old. Why am I still at the kid's table? You know, and whatever it might be. Family is interesting. Family gets weird, and we all love each other. We have these common bonds bringing us together, and it is weird, and it is beautiful, and it is strange, and it is awesome. And when you look at the church family across the globe, things get real weird real quick, right? Now, if we look at just the Baptist family, if we look at just Baptist denominations and strains and stuff that we have, hey, we got all types. Check in on this. Or we got Liberty Baptists. We got Free Will Baptists. We got Confessional Baptists. We got Fundamental Baptists. We got Independent Baptists. We got landmark Baptists, we got old regular Baptists, and we have regular Baptists. We have cooperative Baptists, we have separate Baptists, we have united Baptists, we have reformed Baptists, we have primitive Baptists, we have seventh-day Baptists, we have sovereign grace Baptists, we have missionary Baptists, and let's not forget our foot-washing Baptists. And uh, we have all types in the Baptist family, so to speak, and it's diverse, and it's interesting, and there's so much variety. But despite the, the variety in God's family, we can find true belonging in His unity. Despite all that variety we have, despite all our differences, we can find true belonging under His unity. And belonging matters to us as human beings. God designed us this way. Of course, all you introverts out there are like, ah, belonging, belonging, I'm good. No, you, we all want to belong to something, maybe on your own terms or whatever that looks like, but we want to be a part of something that's meaningful. We want to have a sense of purpose and do that with other people. And uh, we want to find affinity somewhere, whether it be a Facebook group or something we, we share a common bond with other people on. I mean, when I think about working out, it's a very individual kind of thing. I go to the gym, I go to my machine, do my thing, or if I'm working out at home, do something pretty simple. I mean, a lot of people who like to work out, man, they're doing like... Camp Gladiator kind of stuff. Let's all work out together and be a team and do this. And that's cool, you know? And it's, it's different. But we all want belonging. But what does it mean to belong to the house of God? What does it mean to belong to the church family? What does that look like? Now, we could really unpack that in all different kinds of ways. We could really spend a whole series on that. But I want to zero in on how the Apostle Paul uses a particular Greek word, okaios, which means belonging to the house of God. The root word is oikos, which means family or dwelling. 
And so the Apostle Paul uses this Greek word to convey some very particular things about what the household of God is about and what it looks like and what the church family is supposed to look like and what it is about as well. So we're going to open up our Bible to Ephesians chapter 2, verse 19. Ephesians chapter 2, verse 19. We're going to unpack several different passages today. And to give you a little bit of context into this passage, the Apostle Paul wrote this from prisons, one of the prison epistles. He wrote it to the church at Ephesus, and he had a close bond with them, spent a good amount of time there. And this letter is kind of formal because the church at Ephesus was actually a pretty good church. They had a lot of good things going on. And, and so the letter was there to kind of encourage them to continue to mature in their faith. And so we find this passage in Ephesians chapter 2, verse 19 to 22. So then, you are no longer foreigners and strangers, but fellow citizens with the saints. Now, I want you to pay close attention to all the building metaphors in here, the building language that Paul uses. And the members of God's household, there's that Greek word, okaios, that we talked about, built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets with Christ Jesus himself as the cornerstone. In him, the whole building being put together grows into a holy temple in the Lord. In him, you're also being built together for God's dwelling in the Spirit. We look at this passage and it becomes very clear the church family is a belonging built by God. We have a belonging unlike any other kind of belonging and bond because it is built by God himself. And it's no wonder no matter who you are or where you're coming from, what your background is, what your nationality is, what your ethnicity is, what your family history is, no matter who you are, where you have been or what you have done, you can you can belong in church. And it's only because God himself has built it. Now, I recognize there are many people that feel like they don't belong in church. I, I totally understand that. We got our own language. We got our own rules. We got, we, we're weird. If you didn't grow up in the church, you got to understand that. We're weird. And for those of us who've grown up in the church for a long time, we don't recognize that. There are many people that don't feel comfortable in a church and there's a lot of thoughts that run through their head. And guess what? That's okay. And if you're listening to this online or you're here visiting and those thoughts are running through your head, let me know. This, I want you to know this is a good church. This church will let you feel like you can belong. I mean, we had one Sunday where a guy walked into our front door with a chicken on his head. I kid you not. And guess what? It was just another Sunday. You know? Y'all are a good church. I really are. I want to talk to you as the Apostle Paul talks to the church of Ephesus. You are a good church. You make people feel belong. Belonged? Is that even a word? You make people feel like they can belong here. Continue that good work. I want to commend y'all on that. Now, how is this accomplished? Well, God built it. Well, how did he build it? Look back at actually verse 13 in chapter 2. It says this, But now in Christ Jesus... You who are far away, talking about the Gentiles, have been brought near by the blood of Christ. We were built by the blood of Christ. We are able to have all this diversity and this variety and brought near to Christ because of the blood of Christ. And the Apostle Paul is addressing the, the Gentiles here. Now, quite literally, we're far, physically far from the epicenter of God's presence, the temple in Jerusalem. And when the temple curtain was torn in two, the Apostle Paul made it very clear, hey, you've been brought near because the blood of Christ has now separated, torn down that separation. We all have access to the Heavenly Father through Jesus. Because of the blood of Christ, we all can now be brought near to God. And that's a beautiful and wonderful thing. Look at uh, verse 19. And actually, in Romans chapter 18, Chapter 8, verse 15, the Apostle Paul talks about how we've been adopted as sons. There's a spirit of adoption. We can actually cry out to the Father, Abba, Father. We've been adopted into God's family because of the blood of Christ. Christ's death was the price for our adoption to his family. 
That is an amazing thing. We are belonging, built by God. Look at verse 19. The Apostle Paul says, you know, we are citizens with the saints. We are all citizens of the same affinity, the same group, the same kingdom of God. These walls have been torn down between Jews and Gentiles. And the idea of citizenship to the Apostle Paul would have been very, very important to him. He was a Jew of Jews. He was a Pharisee, but he was also a Roman citizen. You know, he had this amazing pedigree of both being a high-ranking Jewish person with a lot of respect and also having a Roman citizenship, which was a big deal. There was only one citizenship that mattered to Paul, and that was his heavenly citizenship. And it's easy to get caught up in our affinities to different groups, maybe even nationality, and like, I'm an American, I'm a this, I'm a that. There is only one, only one belonging that truly matters, and that is a family of God. And this, this is key, because we can find our belonging in all kinds of places. But if we don't recognize the value and the importance of becoming a part of the family of God, we're missing out. Look at verse 20. Verse 20 talks about Christ as the cornerstone. You know, about a year and a half ago, we had this really bad drought, and this summer was awful, too. We started noticing some cracks in our walls. Well, there were some, but they started to get a lot bigger. And the cracks in our tiles started to get a little bit wider, a little bit bigger. We had some doors at the top of the house that didn't quite close anymore, a toilet that didn't flush real great, and we started to get really concerned. Like, okay, it was bad, but now it seems to be really bad. This foundation seems to be really kind of breaking in half. And so we called somebody in to inspect it, and sure enough, it was about three inches too low. So really, if you get really much further into this, your plumbing's going to get broken. You've got some serious issues. And so we had to pay a company to come out, dig up underneath the foundation, and jack it back into place. And I could actually, there was a, a crack in our garage running across the floor. And I actually stood in the garage as they were slowly jacking it back into place. And I actually stood there and watched as that crack would slowly close up. It was a cool thing to watch. But when the foundation of a house is broken, it affects everything else. Christ must be the cornerstone. When the ancient people would build a building, they would take a literal cornerstone and they would make sure it's perfectly cut and make sure it was aligned in a particular way. They would take that perfectly cut stone, put it in the literal corner of what they were building, and the whole house, the whole building was aligned with that cornerstone. If the cornerstone was off, the whole building was off. If Christ is not the cornerstone, everything is off. With Jesus as the cornerstone, the house of God is built true. Christ must be the cornerstone. In Isaiah, he talks about the Messiah being a cornerstone that people could build their lives upon that would give them an unshakable faith. And on the flip side, Jesus actually quotes Psalm 118 in Mark chapter 12. He says, and he makes it very clear that he is the cornerstone that's going to be rejected. There are those who will build their lives that belong to the church family, belong to the family of God, that build their lives upon the rock of Christ, but there are those who reject that cornerstone. And you cannot reject the cornerstone of Christ and still want to be part of the church family. You can't. Our family is built by God on this cornerstone. You can't say, I want all the benefits of being part of a church fellowship, all the fun that comes with it, all the the great things of being part of a church fellowship, but no thank you, Jesus. I'm sorry. You can't. This belonging is built on the cornerstone of Christ. Now, you can build your family. You can build your community. You can build your church on anything on any foundation, but if it's not built on Christ, it will not prevail. Contrast this to the temple of Artemis. It was actually right there in Ephesus, a beautiful temple. It's considered the seventh wonder of the world at that time. It was magnificent, center of the town. Everyone would have noticed it. It was huge and glorious. But that was the third iteration of that temple. It had already been destroyed and burned down twice before that, and eventually this temple would be destroyed as well. Nothing will prevail except for the family of God and what God is doing and how much goes wrong in our world because we build 
our lives on something other than the cornerstone of Christ. If we build our lives on anything other than Christ, it falls apart. Look at verse 21 through 22. Let's read that again, actually. In him, the whole building being put together grows into a holy temple in the Lord. In him, you also being built together for, the, for God's dwelling in the Spirit. See, we also have something that unifies all of us, and that is the Holy Spirit. God's family is united by the Holy Spirit as we are both his temple individually and corporately. God is moving in us individually. His spirit is moving through us if we accepted Jesus Christ as our Lord and Savior, but also corporately, together, the spirit moves through us and challenges us and encourages us for this. You know, if we are his temple, then what's our purpose? Our purpose is to worship him. Our purpose is to lift up the name of God. This temple language would have been very poignant to those in Ephesus, that temple to Artemis there. What do you do at a temple where you worship? At the temple of Artemis, they worshiped someone, but it wasn't the God, it wasn't the living God, it was Artemis. And so daily we have this contrast for the church of Ephesus to see this. We are a temple, a real temple, where you worship the living God, not something that's not alive. And God's family lives to put God first. That's what we are about. In Romans chapter 12, verse 1, the Apostle Paul says, offer yourself up as a living sacrifice. As a church family built by God, this is what we're built for, for worship. For worship. Now, let's continue reading in 1 Timothy chapter 3, verse 15. Go ahead and turn your Bibles to 1 Timothy chapter 3, verse 15. 1 Timothy chapter 3, verse 15. And to give you a little context on this book, quickly, the Apostle Paul wrote this to Timothy, who was a pastor at Ephesus. So we got an Ephesus connection kind of going on here, as you'll notice. And so he wrote this to a young pastor, Timothy, who was pastoring in Ephesus. And he says this in verse 15. And the book of Timothy is very practical. Now, here's some actual real-world things to do from these principles and how to do church. So let's look at this in verse 15. But if I should be delayed, I have written so that you will know how people ought to conduct themselves in God's household. There's that uh, oikos word again, which is the church of the living God, the pillar and foundation of the truth. A lot to unpack there. Now, if you look at this passage, it becomes very clear We are belonging to a way of behavior. He uses the word conduct. And now I was kind of hesitant to use the word behavior because I think it can kind of lend itself to some unhealthy Christian living notions about behavior modification or maybe some Phariseeism or legalism or um, just maybe some hypocritical attitudes. If I just work on my outside, my behaviors, and not really concerning my motivations, that can be a dangerous thing. But at the end of the day, If we're part of God's family, there should be a certain conduct we expect. You know, with kids, it's like, okay, you can behave one way at home, but hey, at church, don't you embarrass me at church, right? Don't you you embarrass me at church. But we sort of expect there should be a certain kind of conduct, not just at church, but as believers, as part of church family, you know. And as parents, it's really easy to get caught in just the behavioral element of things too, right? If I'm just being honest. Sometimes we get so caught up in just, I just want you to do the right thing. I just want you to learn this behavior and get caught up in that. You know, because sometimes we think, if I can just get them to practice certain behaviors, I can build in them a certain character. And to some extent, that's kind of true. Like, if I can get you just to clean your room, then maybe you'll learn to value and be a good steward of what you have. If I can get you to, you know, pick up after yourself or to not hit your brother, maybe we can value peace and unity right? And we work on these things, but sometimes we have to take the time to have conversations with our kids. Like, okay, why was this a temptation for you? What was, what were you struggling with inside that you were tempted to not be honest in this situation and have those conversations? But sometimes you can't have those conversations because you're in a parking lot and you don't want your kid to get run over, right? And so we have to learn how to do that. So as parents, I get it. It's really easy for us to get caught up in just focusing on behaviors. 
especially with our kids, but it's very easy to forget the why. Why we do a thing matters as much as the thing we do. Why we do a thing matters as much as the thing we do. Because here's the deal. At the end of the day, the conduct and attitudes of God's kids should reflect the commands and attributes of the Heavenly Father. At the end of the day, our conduct and attitudes of God's kids should reflect the commands and attributes of their Heavenly Father. And sometimes as parents, we get to see that come to fruition and it's a beautiful thing. We were at um, some kind of indoor fun park place and they had all kinds of games and activities for kids to do in there and they had uh, some bumper cards and some of these bumper cards actually rotated upside down. And of course, none of my kids would do it. They're like, but daddy, you have to do it. I'm like, all right, fine. I will be the guinea pig and I will get on the bumper card that turns me upside down. And uh, to much of their own hilarity and laughing, I endured this, and I, uh, I kept my lunch down. That was, that was a win. <clears throat> and then they decided to go do the rock climbing they had over there, which was really cool. And they got them all strapped into their harnesses, and they're ready to go. But there was one little girl that had gone ahead and was in their harness, strapped up, and it was at the top of one of the rock climbing things. And her mom was down at the bottom trying to cajole her to come back down, and the girl was not having it. She's like, uh-uh, no, I got up here, but I'm too scared to come down. And the worker there was trying to get her, encourage her to come down. She wouldn't come down. And eventually she looked at Lively and she said, you want to help her come down? And, and Lively was like, sure, I'm ready to go. And Lively climbed up and got up next to this little girl and kind of showed her way to come back down. And the girl borrowed, I guess, some of her courage or whatever and felt safe and came back down and to her mom and everybody was happy. And I was so proud of her. I was. We get chances to brag on our kids sometimes. I'm proud of my oldest daughter, Hanalei, when she was, you know, was a new kid at her One Day Academy. She took an initiative to welcome her and make sure that she had a friend. Why we do a thing matters. And we're motivated by love. You know, it's, we are the church of the living God. We are the church of the living God, and our lives should be alive with love. Why we do a thing matters as much as a thing it does. And love is what's supposed to motivate us. Look at John chapter 13, 34 to 35. After washing his disciples' feet, Jesus said, I give you a new command, love one another, as if that was really new. He said, listen, the world will know you're my disciples. Not by your fancy T-shirts, your logos, your slogans, your beautiful church buildings, all your cool things you got going on, your music programs, your slick sermons. No, you'll know you are my disciples by your love for each other. Love, our love that we have for one another. That's what's to be our most incredible marking aspect of who we are as a church family. And here's the deal. I know this is not some revelation. You're like, oh, <laughs> it never occurred to me. I am supposed to love my fellow believer. I'm supposed to love other people. This is a new idea. I never... Wow, I'm supposed to love people? Man, had not thought of that one. So good I showed up to church this morning. This is not a revelation. I know this. This is a reminder. We must be reminded of these things. I was watching some sci-fi show, and yes, I'm totally playing my nerd sci-fi card right now, unashamedly. And in this sci-fi show, there's two, don't laugh, there's two robots that were talking to each other. To, okay, totally sentient, whatever. And they were having a conversation. They were confused. Why do humans build these monuments? And one of the robots said, you know what? I figured this out. See, I can't forget anything. If I want to, I remember everything as a robot. If I want to forget something, I actually have to physically delete it. Human beings forget very easily. It's just why they're so quick to put up monuments to remind themselves of things so they don't forget. We are forgetful creatures. We need to be reminded, yeah, love. That's what we're about as a church. At the end of the day, that's what marks us, and, and that's what motivates our behavior. So what are these truths that are a foundation for our conduct of love? What are they inspired from? Well, let's look at verse 16. In verse 16, reading on in 1 Timothy chapter 3, verse 16, these truths that our conduct of love are laid out very clearly. 
It says this, and most certainly the mystery of godliness is great. When it talks about mystery, it's not talking about some kind of like, hey, let's figure this out, we don't really know. No, when the Apostle Paul talks about the mystery of something, it's something, the truth of the church and the gospel that was not clear until Jesus died on the cross. This is a great mystery, this wonderful and beautiful thing called the church and what Jesus had done and accomplished, the good news. So when he talks about the mystery, that is what he's referring to. So the mystery of godliness is great, and he lists out these, this list of truths that our conduct is supposed to be based on. One, he was manifested in the flesh. Two, and notice, what do all these things involve? Who do all these truths involve? Jesus. Jesus. Vindicated in the spirit, seen by angels, preached among the nations, believed on in the world, and taken up in glory. Let's unpack these quickly, these pillars of truth. Now, before, actually, before I do that, you're probably wondering, why do we have to have certain beliefs and have these sort of in common? Well, some people have asked, well, why do we have a membership process? Why can't we just say, yes, I'm a Christian, let's do this? It's not that simple. Think about it. Why do you date, get engaged before you get married? It's because you want to get to know somebody. Are we compatible for companionship? The same thing goes for church membership. Are you compatible for membership? Do we have the same values? Are we going the same direction? Do we believe the same things? Are we on the same page? Can we coexist together and be united on what really and truly matters? Membership matters because we have to unify. We have to believe the same things because if we don't, there will be no unity. And so membership matters for these kinds of things. And when you get married, you're coveting yourself to another person. When you choose to become a member of a church, you're covenanting yourself to a church. You're bonding. Say, we are together in this. And so let's unpack these truths. The first one, he was manifested in the flesh. That's talking about the incarnation of Christ. Jesus was homoousios, the Latin word meaning of the same essence of God, the same kind of nature of God. He is 100% God, 100% man. It is a mystery. It is true. But if Jesus was not God, the gospel does not work. It doesn't. We have to be on the same page about this. Because if a, a good man died, his death would count for one. But because Jesus was God, he was infinitely good and able to cover an infinite amount of sin guilt. It only works if Jesus himself dies on the cross, so we have to believe this pillar. And the second line, vindicated in the Spirit, some interpreters will say this is a reference to when Jesus was baptized and the Spirit descended upon him. More than likely, because it's using the word vindicated, which is kind of courtroom language, it's reference to his death, that he died a sinner's death, but he did not stay dead, he rose again. And his rising again, his spirit being quickened and raised is a vindication that he was God, that he was pure and holy and good, and that is for us to celebrate in good for all. And then it says, seen by angels, this is a testament to his heavenly presence and that his witness, not just people on earth, but also by the heavenly uh, angels as well. And the fourth line, preached among the nations, referring to the fact that Jesus offers salvation for all peoples. It's not just for the Jews anymore. It's not just for a particular kind of person. The salvation that Jesus offers is for everyone. Now, many will reject, obviously, but it is offered to everyone. See, it's not just that we, we're not just a moral people. We're a missional people. We can't just be a good people. Being good is not good enough if we're not willing to go. We can't just be good enough. We must be willing to go. We are not just moral people. We are a missional people. If salvation is offered to everyone, then we are a part of that. We get to offer that. And the fourth line, preached among the nations. Um, sorry, the fifth one, believed on in the world. So not only has Jesus been preached on in the world, but he's also been believed. People have responded all over the world. The global response validates his realness. It's a testimony to, hey, it's offered everyone, and everyone, there's at least one person from every tribe and tongue that will respond to this. And lastly, taken up into glory, the ascension of Christ points to the authority of Christ. He sits at the right hand of the Father. We 
trust in Jesus. We're leading in him. And because he ascended to heaven, one day he is returning again to make all things right and all things good. These are the pillars of truth. These are the things, this is our belonging. This is what is rooted in these beliefs. And we must hold to it. And just like the myriad of grand pillars held up this amazing temple of Artemis, these pillars hold up our belonging. These truths hold us up as a church family. Now, our love for each other is held up by these pillars. And while we're not a perfect family, nobody is. I know the church has caused wounds at writ large because we're, we're full of broken people. We're not perfect. We make mistakes. We're trying to figure this out. But here's the deal. The church, by and large, has been a tremendous force for good in the world. The church has done more good than people realize, and it's done amazing things. And it's a beautiful and wonderful thing, and we need to remember that. And that actually brings me to our next passage that we're going to read today. And it's found in Galatians chapter 6, verses 9 through 10. Galatians chapter 6, verse 9 through 10. You open your Bibles to Galatians chapter 6, verse 9 through 10. He says this. And again, to give a little context first too, Galatians was actually written by Paul from Ephesus. So Paul was staying in Ephesus at the time of writing this and wrote it to the Galatians. And the book of Galatians is kind of an angry book. It, the Galatians, and kind of for good reason, the Galatians were really struggling with some Judaizers, some people who were putting some extra requirements on top of the gospel to be saved. And the apostle Paul was lit about this. I mean, he was not happy. And in fact, at one point towards the end of the book, he actually takes the quill out of the scribe's hand and writes it in his own hand. He says, and now see here, I'm writing this with my own hand in bold letters. Paul basically invented the all caps text, okay? <laughs> and so the book of Galatians is a little bit different than the book of Ephesians. And so we look, let's read this passage. And so he's, effect, he's confronting this Judaizers, which again, this would come up again in the Jewish council in Acts chapter 15, talking about making sure they had everything straight about these kinds of things. But let's look at chapter 6, verse 9. Let us not get tired of doing good, for we will re reap at the proper time if we don't give up. Therefore, as we have opportunity, let us work for the good of all, especially for those who belong to the household of faith household faith. We are to do good for all, but especially for our own house. And going looking at verse 9, if we're going to do good, we're going to need some encouragement. Doing good requires something of us. It's not passive. It's active. It requires us to pour out of ourselves. It requires sacrifice. It requires dedication. All those of you who faithfully serve every Sunday in your various different tasks, it requires your time. You give up. You could be doing anything. But to do good requires something from us, to give up something. And i I got to brag on you again. This is an encouraging church. When Pastor Wes addressed and said, listen, hey, this month is, uh, I think October, was Pastor Appreciation Month, and the cards that y'all gave us and the gifts, you guys, y'all make it easy to serve you. You're a good church. So thank you for the encouragement. And always count on some of y'all to give an encouraging word. And it makes it easy to serve. Keep up the good work. We're proud of you. Keep encouraging. We need this. We need to invigorate each other in our optimism. We need to invigorate each other's optimism. Because here's the reality. It is so easy to get jaded. It is so easy to lose sight of what we're doing. It is so easy to become cynical. I remember when I was studying youth ministry in college, my youth ministry professor, Huli Goddard, he shared the story of how he was at a big youth convention, and he was up on stage with a fellow youth pastor who had been in the ministry for a while, and out in front of him was a crowd of thousands of youth. And this other youth pastor told Huli, he said, man, look at out there. Look at all that filth. And my youth pastor Professor Yuli Goddard was just taken back. 
Like, how did you get so jaded? When Jesus looked out of the crowd, he had compassion. He looked at the crowd and saw they were like sheep without a shepherd. It's easy to get cynical and jaded. We have to invigorate each other's optimism. Look at verse 10. We need to also engage in opportunities. You know, a family that does not take care of its own is not the kind of family that other people want to be a part of. Think about that. If we don't take care of each other, who'd want to join our family? We have to take care of our own. And, you know, our food pantry is an awesome ministry. And if you're, part, if you're a church member, you have access to it 24-7, no questions asked. We will take care of our family, and we want other people to be part of it. See, we can be a family of optimists seizing opportunities for charity. We can be a family of optimists believing that God can do good work, that God can change lives, seizing opportunities for charity, to make a difference in this world that God has put us in. Now, how did the early church accomplish this? Through radical generosity. Through radical generosity. And church, you have demonstrated this in an incredibly powerful way recently. You have demonstrated this in an incredible powerful way through Operation Christmas Child. Now, you may have noticed there was a lot of shoeboxes up here last Sunday. You set a goal of 800 and one. We reached out to every single grow group leader and said, all right, you tell us what you think your grow group can commit to in terms of shoe boxes. We heard back from every single one of you. We took those numbers, put it together, and tallied it up and said, all right, 801. Well, you brought in a lot of shoe boxes. And uh, eight, zero, and one is in the number that you brought in, except for that number was 1,081 shoe boxes. <laughs> Way to go, church. You've demonstrated radical generosity. The only problem we have is what are we going to do next year? <laughs> I guess our family just needs to grow some and then uh, we can keep this up, right? We are so proud of you guys. 1,081 shoe boxes. And that was accomplished because you believe in what God is doing, you believe in the gospel. And that is a truly tremendous thing. And if, that is more shoe boxes per capita than we've ever done as a church. I don't know if you know that. We've done we did more shoe boxes per capita than we've ever done as a church this year. So well done. But God has called us to minister inside the church so that we can then make a difference outside the church. If we are not healthy and taking care of each other, we can't hope to make a difference outside of our family. We can't. And so we have so many opportunities that we make a difference in this community. We support the pregnancy center. We got the food pantry, which I mentioned before. And this season in particular, there's so many opportunities for you as well. You know, we have our huge gingerbread bash thing for families. Man, grandparents, bring your grandkids there. They're going to hear the gospel there. Bring your friends. Bring your family. We have our Christmas concert. People can hear the gospel there. The good news we have our uh, festival, the city's putting on the Festival of Lights. We have huge activities that the church, that the city's putting on. But our church gets to serve our community by having a really cool kids space. And you can serve and volunteer and make a difference and invite people in our community to our various different Christmas events this year. So many opportunities to make a difference. See, the church family is a vector for God's grace in both direction and magnitude. God has us going somewhere, and where we go, we are going to make a difference because he is a part of it. We are both a vector for God's grace in direction and magnitude. Now, see, we may not be able to solve all the problems in this world, but we do know that Jesus is the answer. Amen. Amen. And that's what brings us together as a family. We have a belonging that is built by God. We have a belonging to a way of behavior and conduct. We have a belonging that is rooted in truth. We have a belonging for benevolence. This is our church family. This is what God has called us to do. Let's pray. 
dear heavenly Father, thank you that we get to call you Father, that we are your kids and we can trust you for what good is, what real is, what truth is. Help us to be a house, a home that honors you. You are the architect of this home. Jesus, you're the cornerstone of everything we do here. Help us not to forget that. You have a purpose for us. So God, we ask that you would move in us. We confess to you at times we become cynical and jaded. We think, oh no, things will never change. This person will never change. But you can do good. You can change a life. Your spirit moves in through us. So today, this morning, may you invigorate our souls. May we believe a little bit more in what you can do. May us, we don't want to get tired of doing good because you are doing good in us. Help us not to be reservoirs of your grace, but to be channels, vectors of your grace to all those that you've placed in our lives. So this morning, as we connect with you, may we recommit our lives to being active members of your church family. And this morning, if you're not a part of God's family, and you know you're not, this is a time for you to make that decision. Say, I want that. I want to belong to something that matters, to someone that matters. I want a belonging that lasts. I want a belonging that matters. I want to be a part of God's family. Submit to him. Submit to the one that loves you beyond measure. Submit to the one that laid down his life so we could have a cornerstone for this belonging. We pray this in your holy and good name. Amen.